Our next speaker told me, you can't be more local than locals, meaning if you're moving into a market, you need to spend that much more time understanding it, like finding out why bikes might work for Berlin, but they might not work for LA. Ralph Piegan is the VP of Central and Eastern Europe at Deezer, and he spent all of his career in digital music and a lot of time in markets like China and India, where he's honed his eye for recognizing subtle local differences and finding out how to build strategies around them. In this next talk, Ralph is going to share how Deezer strikes the right balance between making use of global economies of scale and unique local approaches. Let's give him a big hand. So, good morning. Good morning and uh, thank you very much for having me and uh, I feel a bit intimidated with the talk earlier which is so inspiring and now we move back to the very mundane of marketing uh, strategies. Um, one quick question, I only have one que question, uh, who has a music streaming subscription in the audience? Oh wow, wow, <laughs> that's very encouraging, also tells you a little bit how advanced this market um, already is. For those of you who don't have a music streaming subscription or might use another one than ours, um, I give you a short intro uh, who we actually are. So this is one of the largest audio music streaming services globally. Uh, we have a freemium model, means you can register and use the service uh, with restrictions for free. And then, of course, you can uh, upgrade to a monthly paid subscription service, which gives you unlimited uh, access to all its features. Um, in the premium segment, we have a specific offer for the student audience as well as for families, where you get uh, six profiles that you can share among the family. And then we have one high-quality audio offering, which is called Hi-Fi. Deezer is actually one of the pioneers in music streaming, which is often overlooked. It has been founded already in 2007. It is a French company, and currently we have um, a bit more than 53 million tracks in our catalog, which makes it also one of the largest um, catalogs that is available. And we serve this content to a bit more than 40 million active users a month, and Deezer is available in more than 180 countries. And so we are a true global service. And quite early in the history of Deezer, the decision was made for, for the rollout to provide access to Deezer basically globally. And of course, this comes with its challenges, but it also really um, has a lot of significant advantages because from the, the get-go, you learn how users interact with your service, what music they are listening to, when they are listening to music, and you can not only um, improve your product development based on those insights, but obviously also shape your local marketing strategy based on everything that you learn from that. Um, to put it into context, what is the industry that we are uh, in? Uh, music subscription has uh, now reached 3.5 billion in revenue in the first half of 2018. Um, we are still, the whole industry is growing over 40% year on year, but at the same time, the penetration rate of music streaming is still somewhere around 20%, and this varies obviously significantly uh, by market, and especially like my region is from the Netherlands to Russia and the CIS countries, countries like Kazakhstan, and you can imagine the streaming penetration is significantly different in, in those. If we look at the um, competitive landscape, you have on the one hand the big corporate players, um, namely Apple, Amazon, and, and Google, and then on the other side, you have the so-called pure plays, um, of course, with Spotify, us, and then a couple of other companies um, that aim for the same goal. 
So if you are in this context, so on the one hand, you have a significant growth opportunity in terms of penetrating a market. And on the other side, you have fierce competition. Then, of course, the only name of the game is scaling as fast as possible and ideally globally. But then, very quickly, you realize that the world is actually local. And especially for a product like music, which is highly local, and then you have a new technology, which is music streaming, so you need to have the typical adoption curve for new technologies. Um, and then you have a paradigm shift in how music is consumed, because we move from an ownership-based industry or consumption to access only. And all those developments happen at very different speeds depending on the country, but you need basically to address all of them at the same time. So this brings a couple of challenges with it. On the global side, you need to have a universal value proposition. So the core product needs to meet the needs in basically every country. Um, ideally, from a, if you are not like funded excessively, but you somehow have to keep the cost in check, um, you aim for central execution. So ideally, every big marketing campaign that you run can be executed um, centrally. And then you have generally, from a messaging point of view, you need to balance your message that, that conveys the universal value proposition with more locally tailored messages. So quite often, you sacrifice scale, meaning you can run the campaign in more countries, um, versus a more detailed message that speaks to a specific market. And then on the local side, well, local by definition doesn't scale. So the question is always how much do you invest in it if you cannot scale? Um, and this brings with it resource constraints very, very often, especially when you are like these in 180 countries. It's also like a, a management topic is where to put when how many resources, um, and what is your relevant investment there. And there is lots of opportunity, which quite often you cannot satisfy um, or go after because you have resource constraints. And then um, one thing that is really important, which I have learned over and over again in my career, is when you are a global player, you are a global player. You are not the local one. So. When you face local competition, don't try to become more local than them. It won't work. So ultimately, it's about finding the right balance in this heavy scale context. And the way we approach that um, at DISA, but also think is a, is a good way generally, is when we talk about the universal value proposition of music streaming, or generally the product, everything is done globally, centrally. Those are your performance acquisition campaigns. And whereas a global team can run 50 to 100 creatives at the same time, they can super fast detect which are the creatives that work the best. But then the question is, how do you develop those creatives further to make even more performing um, creatives. And this is where the local teams come in. They, of course, localize the creatives, translate the creatives, but they also give guidance why a specific creative might work better than the other one. When we then move to awareness campaign, especially big ATL campaigns or TV campaigns, the local input is by far more important because um, you have a, a, a TV ad um, is happening in a cultural context. And it might be the people that you show in the TV ad, it might be the music that you use um, in the TV ad, so you need by far more local input, but at the same time, um, ideally you want to have one production that satisfies the need of the world. And then you, find, you need to find the balance between this central cost efficiency point of view and at the same time having enough versions 
that potentially work um, in South America um, the same as they would do in South Korea. And then um, the, the last point where all the focus sits with the local teams is when it comes to brand perception and your brand positioning. Um, because especially in music, this is basically where you tell the audience what you stand for. And um, in that area, from a, from a global point of view, it's uh, mainly providing a framework that local teams can develop and execute um, the campaigns. And in, in general, when it comes to messaging, especially on content-driven um, products, for us, it, um, you can see that we start with a uh, very universal message on a global level, but it's very product-focused because the product is a global one. It's not localized in a sense that it's individual features by country. Um, and then slowly moving to a content focus where the messaging is all about what is it what we're actually offering. And so I want to give two examples for local campaigns, both of them executed in Germany, and some of the key learnings that we, that we took away from them. Um, the first campaign we ran in 2017, it was called, well, internal title, Love is in the Air, and we selected three cities for a test in order to skate it later across Germany, and the the idea was that we want to be where our users are. So music is part of your life, and we want to reach the audience where their life is happening. And that is, as opposed to some other companies who put up their billboards on the side of big building and tourist hotspots, and where you always have to look up, and it's more like an aspirational point of view, um, we wanted to meet the audience at eye level. Um, and that's important for us as Deezer in general, um, that our users and us, we should meet at um, eye level. And so two of the things that we did, and we did a lot of things, um, we used postcards and we used um, billboards that are in uh, living, like residential neighborhoods, um, and they are hung next to like concert posters and so on. So the context is, this is where you live, and the postcards are like in restaurants, cafes, um, uh, where you also live and, and um, have your breakfast. After the first flight, obviously, we did an analysis of this campaign, and there were two main challenges that we um, saw with that campaign. First of all, as you can see, it is very detailed. So basically, every single city had its own set of creatives. And this eats away a lot of resources. And then if you want to scale it and run it maybe in 23 cities, then you have to multiply the effort. Or, of course, always you look for a partner who can do that for you. Um, and then you run into uh, cost and efficiency issues. So um, that was the one challenge. It's hard to scale, it takes a lot of, a, away a lot of resources, but the worst part is um, everything nowadays is tracked. So we, we track literally everything that we do. And for a campaign like this, it starts with figuring out what is the correct set of metrics that you want to track, and how, what is the impact that you expect from this campaign. And we picked a couple, and we didn't see any impact on all of those. So in this environment where there's a lot of pressure on scale, a campaign like this is very short-lived because you won't do a second flight because you cannot show that you are even on the right track. And because of that, we decided to end the campaign, which was very sad because it's a really nice campaign, um, and we're looking for alternatives. And one of the alternatives and the key element is actually not a campaign, but it turned out to be a partnership. And at the end of 2017, we struck an agreement with a company called Nike's Next Bike, and the, uh, they had just been awarded to be the official bike sharing scheme of Berlin. 
And uh, the partnership not only includes the branding on more than 2,000 bikes and a couple of hundred stations in Berlin, but it also gives our premium users um, the advantage that they can use every single first, every single ride the first 30 minutes for free. Um, and then, of course, like after 29 minutes, you can return the bike, you can rent a new one, and it will always be free. Um, so, but legally, it's only the 31st minutes. Uh, first 30 minutes. Um, and so, this campaign addressed a lot, addresses a lot of the challenges. First of all, um, you start the partnership and then basically it runs by itself. It, will, it, it requires very little um, maintenance. The other one, as you might have seen when you wander around Berlin, the brand is visible all year round all over the city. And that is something that is not viable for most out-of-home campaigns that you can do. So there's, there's a big, big advantage in, in doing it um, that way. And then, of course, most importantly, we saw results. And the unfortunate thing is that I can't actually really tell you what you're looking at here. <laughs> so, um, but there are two things. First of all, the graph measures some sort of engagement. It's an engagement metric. Um, and it's for a set of users that are actually in Berlin. And the other graphs show engagement from users in other cities or regions. And the key message here is that, as you can see, the line starts at one point to separate itself from the other um, cities. And this is so significant because engagement, at least for us, is a key churn predictor. And in order to grow sustainable, you need obviously to focus a lot of your attention on churn. And so that is extremely encouraging. It tells us by far more than only what we, what we are doing with Nextbike, but informs us about the level of visibilities that you need to require. And there might be very different approaches to it. Um, and of course, you can scale, because bike sharing schemes and you read in the press, they're basically everywhere, so there's a lot of opportunity, but it doesn't have to be bike sharing. The one thing that you might say is, yes, but then your message is not very local, because it's just the diesel logo, and um, anecdotal, um, anecdotal feedback from this campaign is, because of the brand awareness that we have, is that quite a few people think that actually we are a bike-sharing scheme. And uh, I'm, I'm approached when it's like, ah, I work for these, and it's like, oh, you work for the bikes, that's awesome. Um, so you see there are pitfalls when, when doing this kind of campaigns. Um, so a presentation about a music streaming service would not be complete if I would not talk at least a little bit about content. And what I have said about like being locally relevant in your marketing obviously is even truer for content. And at Deezer we focus a lot on making sure that when you open the app, regardless of where you are in the world, you have locally relevant content. And so we put a lot of effort not only in local music creation, but also in uh, content uh, creation, especially in, in Germany. I think we now have more than eight Deezer Originals podcasts that we already launched. And as I've heard, like, podcasts are super interesting. The same applies to us. And then you can't stop at local. So you have to be personal and as personal as possible. And for this part, Deezer has a very unique feature um, that's called Flow, and it's an endless list of music that you can listen to that learns by your behavior. And while playlists that are personalized are not exactly new, um, what is really unique is that this, this list of songs, it interacts with you in real time, meaning it's not created like on one day and then you listen to the next personally curated 
playlist on the next day, but why you're listening to it and why you say, I don't like this song, I skipped this song, I like that song, it will adjust the future tracks based on what you want um, to listen to. And I would be uh, super psyched to, to tell you a bit more what it actually takes on a global level to make it personally relevant, um, but this would be uh, more the topic for another talk. Thank you. Ralph, thank you so much. I would like to take a couple of questions from the audience. I've seen that we have a few really good ones, so if oh. you have time. <laughs> okay. So, one person asks anonymously, how did you make, <laughs> <laughs> how did you make the choice of the three cities for the campaign Love is in the Ear? Uh, I, I was hoping I have not to go into that. So Berlin was super obvious um, because we are based in Berlin and it's easy to track the campaign. Cologne, we had a couple of regions where we looked at engagement um, and where we, where we thought like we have a good penetration of Deezer and the high engagement, so it makes sense to make a brand positioning campaign there. And Bielefeld, um, Bielefeld was taken because we had uh, our head of marketing at that time, she came from Bielefeld, and she told me that nothing is ever happening in Bielefeld, and so if we do a campaign there, we will certainly see a big impact. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so um, another question we have is, how important is the first mover advantage in the platform universe? Um, on a global scale, it's, it's actually really important, but it's not enough. So being available in all those countries um, enables us to do, do things. First of all, as I said, like you can learn about the user behavior and then tailor your marketing to it. The other one is partnering. Um, Deezer has over 40 partnerships um, globally. In, in my region, there are alone like 12 telco partnerships. And when you're already in a country, obviously you can take the advantage because if they look as for a music streaming provider, they will come to you. So there are lots of smaller advantages. If you're um, the first there, it doesn't protect you at all uh, when someone comes in. I think we have time for just one more question. Do you okay. have one that you would prefer or would love to answer today? Um, yeah, so there's one that says, do you think that one streaming service will dominate the market in the future 60% plus? Um, that's, that's a really good and very tricky question, and you cannot imagine how often I think about that. Um, I don't think so. Unless someone finds the ultimate lock-in feature. And that's the big difference to a lot of other services. Um, there is no really, the, it's, it's all about music, it's all about content. So in your conversation, you talk about music, you don't talk about the provider, the service of that music. And as long as this um, exists, I don't think it will shift just to, to one player. Also, all the streaming services, um, they're now in the meantime starting to produce, produce their own content. And I believe that targeting specific audiences, you will create also like a followership for those type of contents, and so there will be always um, diversity, even though it looks like that the big corporate players are gaining a lot of traction, let's put it this way. All right, on that note, I think that's all the time we have for questions. I'm sure you'll be around in the coffee break that is after our next panel, so Ralph, thank you very much. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you.